activation and function of T cells. We'll talk about uh, primary T cell response and activation of CD4, especially T cell, because these are the helper cells. Also talk about APC and T cells. And uh, we will also discuss about the signaling pathways as we discussed in B cells. And uh, some of the important aspects or some of the differences that we may have in terms of signaling between B cell and T cells. So these are some of the comparisons that you need to do uh, when you compare B cell versus T cells. Now, as I've been trying to emphasize upon you is that uh, for most of the lecture material that I have for you are pictures, figures, and uh, you need to do the reading part from the book. And uh, the more I read the book, I do see that uh, they have made quite a lot of changes, especially for advancement of signaling pathway. So I wouldn't really recommend at all for you to even read the older book because you may get confused. Because things are changing and they're trying to incorporate the, the updated information. So keep that in mind. And uh, <clears throat> remember when we talked about uh, T cells or any cells which are already there and they are in non-activated state, naive state. And you get infected, you have a problem, they need to get going. So the very first step that will happen in terms of T cells doing their job will be activation. And uh, also keep in mind when I said that uh, for B cell and T cell that T cells would not do things on their own. They have no ability to look at an antigen unless and until it is presented by antigen presenting cells. So keep in mind the interaction between antigen presenting cells and T cells for any good that comes out of a T cell. And when we talk of antigen presenting cells, we talked about professional antigen presenting cell. The best form is dendritic cells. And uh, some of the dendritic cells are in circulation and they are coming from myeloid series. If you remember, we talked about this myeloid series and lymphoid series the other day. And many of them would move from the circulation into tissues like Langerhans cells cells in the in the skin they are best known for antigen presentation and then in mucosa and different parts of the body okay Kufer cells in liver and also remember like naive T cells any antigen presenting cells who has not seen an antigen will be immature it will be immature so it may look like a rounded cell without any dendrite, so to speak. But normally what happens is that there is an expression of some of the molecules on the surface of antigen presenting cells. And uh, also remember that when they are immature, they can be a part of innate immune response and they may have those pattern recognition receptors as we said, are important to recognize some of the patterns that may be there on microorganisms. So they're good enough to uh, take care of uh, general microbial infections, not very specific. So these are like uh, non-specific pattern recognition receptors that they, they may be expressed, we call PRR. Now, <clears throat> as I said that, uh, <clears throat> I'm going to concentrate on uh, figures, and I do have some of the explanation key points for you. And actually, these are talking points for me, but I would want you to read in detail. So the very first step that will happen in terms of activation of a naive cell, you can see from here, is that uh, it needs to talk to an antigen-presenting cell. So this is a naive cell. This is an antigen-presenting cell. It could be a dendritic cell. It could be a B cell. It could be any cell. Okay? Now, 
In order for it to get activated, it needs two signal, first signal and second signal. If either of them is mi missing, T cells would never get activated. It's like they want to see with both eyes. So there are two eyes. First one, a force, is that uh, this T cell has to have a TC TCR receptor. It will see this uh, apitopeptide presented in context of an MSE molecule, and we have a co-receptor. In this case, it doesn't really tell you whether it's CD4 or CD8, but for both. So that's the first signal that you have to have for T cells to get activated. The second signal is the bunch of co-stimulatory molecules that we discussed earlier. Okay, so also keep in mind the difference between a co-receptor and co-stimulatory molecules. CD4, CD8 are co-receptors and there are a bunch of co-stimulatory molecules like, can you give an example for one? ICOS, CD28, ICOS, I take. CD28 happens to be one of the most important molecule which is uh, there, CD28. This CD28, is it present on T cell or is it present on ABC? You are not sure. I mean, I can look at you guys are not sure. Say it again? T cell. So what is the corresponding receptor on the antigen presenting cell to bind to CD28? Huh? B molecule, B1 or 7, correct, B1 or 7. So you can see without going in detail, these are the different co-stimulatory pairs and these two signals will get the cells activated. Okay, now also keep in mind when the T cell get activated, that is go going to perform an immune response and that immune response is also called effector response. For example, one of the things that you want T cells to do will be proliferation. You want T cells to proliferate to fight infection. The other thing you want T cells to do will be release cytokines. The third thing you want T cells to do is to, to develop into different subsets. So there are many things that T cells would do when you get the first signal. So you get activated T cells. Okay. Now, <clears throat> this is an example where a dendritic cell, for example, sitting in a tissue, it's an immature dendritic cell, let's say it's skin, let's take it as a skin example, and uh, you get a cut and one of the bacteria enters into the skin, and now this immature dendritic cell is going to look it up. The most important thing that it will do because it's immature, it just has tall like receptor, and it has phagocytic receptor to basically phagocytose uh, that particular bacteria. And this is non-specific, non-antigen specific because it's not looking at the antigen, okay? It does have MSC class two molecule, but it says low, the expression is low. So there could be upregulation of MSC class two a down regulation of MSC class 2. In order for an antigen presenting cell to basically uh, present a antigen, it has to break it down into smaller particles. Remember, it cannot present this big chunk of bacteria. So it will phagocytose the bacteria, break it apart into small pieces, and put one of the small pieces on top of his MSC class 2. Okay, so this process where a immature dendritic cell become mature can only happen when this dendritic cell sees an antigen or sees a microbe. There's no need for it to, to become mature. The other important thing for this mature Dendritic cell is that once it becomes mature, it will express some of the other molecules over here. I think by now you may be thinking that you just need one MSC class 2 molecule on your cell to talk to T cell. 
but that doesn't happen like that. You have to have hundreds of them. You have to have a fixed number of MSC molecule to break small portion of different bacteria and present to T cell. This is only for figurative purposes or cartoon purposes. We give you an example of one. So there is a down regulation of MSC class two once they get activated. So there's an up regulation. So you can see from only one low MSC, you have many MSC pre presented on this T cell. And now one of these MSC will present this peptide. The other thing that will happen in activation of dendritic cell is that they will also show some of other molecules. Two important molecules are presented on antigen presenting cell. One of them is of course a B7. And why do we need B7? Because B7 needs to talk to CD28. Okay. So unless it appears, it's not going to talk to that. The other important thing is CCR7. CCR7 basically are some chemokine receptors. The idea that we have this chemokine receptor is, remember when there is an injury in some place, like a boil in the hand, there are some of the chemokines released over there to make sure that they can attract chemically those cells that are needed in that place. So we need chemokine receptors for homing. If there are no chemokine receptors, nothing will go and stick over there. So once this dendritic cell becomes mature, the very first thing it will do is it will move from the skin and migrate. So it is full of antigens and is going to go through afferent lymphatics to the draining lymph node. Why does it have to go to the draining lymph node? Because to talk to T cells, because T cells are there. So talk to T cells. It's going to come over here and it will adhere to this place over here and then there it will meet CD whatever cell it needs to meet. For example, if it presents MSC class 2, it's going to see CD4 T cell. And CD4 T cell will have CD28. CD28 will talk to B7. You got first signal and you got second signal. And this T cell will get activated. And then the T cell will proliferate. Remember I said that when you have viral infection, you get lymphocytosis your T cells are proliferating. It's a good response for you to take care of viruses. If your T cells are not proliferating, that's bad for you because there's not a normal immune response. So you need T cell proliferation. And how would that happen? By this process. So there is a dendritic cell maturation in response to a pathogen. It becomes mature. It's going to go and travel to lymphatics. It's going to stay over there because it expresses those CCR7 that will attach to, we call HIV, high endothelial venules, and they will stay over there and present it to CD4, and then this TC, uh, the T cell will activate and then do what it needs to do, okay? So this slide basically shows you uh, antigen presenting cell talking to a T cell in the lymph nodes. So all these things are happening within the lymph nodes. Okay. Now, what you saw in the previous figure was that the antigen presenting cell was talking to CD4 T cells. So there's a paired interaction. Peptide was presented in MSC that pairs with TCR, MSC 2 plus CD4 plus TC is like a TCR, TCR complex that forms three important things. And then you see uh, B7 as, as co-stimulatory pair. The adhesion molecule that you saw in that was like CCR5 or 7. Because these are like snake looking, we call serpentine receptors that are expressed on mature dendritic cell to make sure that they attach to places where they need to attach, like lymph nodes. So these are some of the events we call paired interactions that are taking place uh, in activation of T cell. Now, if you look at APC and you look at T cell, 
you will see the very first thing again MSC class 2 presents a peptide is shown by TCR <coughs> right an alpha beta chain of TCR you have a co-receptor so this is the first signal that you have that you saw for activation the second signal is coming from co-stimulatory pairs it varies from cell to cell well one of the signals that you saw was B7 that talks to CD28 and CD28 is like an accelerator is gonna enhance activation of T cell but when CD28 gets too much enhanced it needs to be controlled it has to be inhibited so what T cell do is that when CD28 is expressed and activation of T cell is enhanced it immediately starts putting up this hatched receptor which is CTLA4 so instead of B7 talking to CD28 it's going to talk to CTLA4 and this will stop activation of cell so CD28 is enhancer and CTLA4 is a blocker that is like a control for co-stimulation that we have then again uh, adhesion pairs are many and remember adhesion pairs are like ICAM and LFA they are present in different colors and shapes in different type of uh, antigen presenting cell because this is just a generic slide it doesn't tell you which APC are we talking about whether it's a D, uh, dendritic cell or B cell so we have at least three of adhesion pairs the reason for these to attach to each other is that some of these talk between antigen pre presenting cell and T cell may be within seconds sometime it happened within minutes sometime it takes eight hours so during that eight hour period it wants to make sure that these are adhered to each other and there is a communication taking place between these signals before the signaling pathway sets in that's why we have to have adhesion molecules okay <clears throat> now let's see so the first signal on the cell surface is maintained and the signal gets in and now we have to go into intracellular signaling as we discussed the other day for B cells okay now this event specifically for CD4 T cells activation may be more or less same as CD8 and BCR so there's a common theme for all the cells when they get activated I'm going to go through it in the next picture but the very first thing that you saw as the first signal was initial signal was that MHC takes the antigen presents to TCR okay and then CD4 clips onto that so the very first signal over here will be the kickstart for this response. But as I said earlier, first signal is not enough. You have a second signal, and second signal is going to come from co-stimulatory molecules. So once it initiates, then all those enzymes which are there in the cytoplasm, I told you like uh, kinases, MAP kinases will get phosphorylated and signaling will go till it reaches the nucleus and the nucleus will initiate the response for example one of the response that you want is that you want more MSC receptor to be placed on the cells okay so that signal will come from outside go to the nucleus and the nucleus will send the command to make more proteins because all of these are proteins if you want cytokines you need nucleus to send a command if you need proliferation you need nucleus to send a command so everything goes from the surface to the nucleus right from outside in everything is outside in and then also keep in mind that we have to terminate this response as well so it's a initiation of response signaling pathway into the nucleus and then termination as well if any of these things are not properly 
controlled, then we may have problems. Okay, so let's see uh, in the figure, <coughs> so you will idea and the, you can compare it. I don't have ability on this slide to compare with the B cell one, but I can assure you uh, most of the signaling pathways are the same. And this is a basic signaling pathway without giving in detail as to what enzymes are involved. Now I want you to pay attention to some of these orange semicircles over here. They indicate phosphate groups. That's where uh, phosphorylation needs to happen. That's where the activation of enzyme happens. Okay. Now, let's go from the top. You have a MSC class 2 presents a peptide and TCR sees it. Okay. And this will see in context with CD4 if it's class 2. Had it been class 1, it would have been CD8. The other important thing that if you look at this picture, is that if I was to ask you, the antigen or peptide is only seen by TCR and not nobody else. CD4 does not see the antigen. What CD4 does it, it wants to make sure that it sees the MSC class 2. So it darts onto MSC class 2. It doesn't, so CD4 don't see the antigen, CD4 see the genes, your genes. Likewise, CD8 as well. Did you notice that? Okay. Now what ha then happens is, as you can see, there are immunoglobin superfamily and they insert their peptides chain, peptide chain, into the plasma membrane. Correct, do you see that? So they have like two legs, and this is the one leg, they all come over here. The interesting thing is that the first signal is there, and this, the ultimate goal of this signaling pathway is that you need to go to the reach the nucleus and get transcription of specific genes of whatever proteins that you're gonna make. So what nature has provided is that these extra pair of proteins are there because they don't really penetrate deep into cytoplasm. So the signal would have stopped over here and would not have gone to the cascade of enzymes that are there in cytoplasm. So you have to have these peptide with longer limbs, like for example, if it has three sugar molecules, they're not good enough. Like TCR, three sugar molecules, you have to have more so that connection is established between the cell surface and the enzymes in there. So that's why uh, you have additional items. You talked about items. They are there, and then you have CD3 molecule. All of them now going to play a role in terms of initiation of the signal. Now this part over here, when a TCR complex talks to T cell, this area over here, if you look at in electron micrographs, you will see like uh, neuromuscular junction. You will see that kind of neuromuscular synapse, exactly there's a immunological synapse there. There's a little bit of gap there, we call it synapse, as we call neuromuscular synapse, okay? Now, this is the first signal. What will happen is that they are, if you notice, and I'll, I, I think if I get time, I can show you some of the uh, cartoons or uh, videos for that as well, but you can Google it, I think it's, it's available. Uh, so what happened is that they are all a little bit scattered. The moment the first signal comes, they tend to cluster. So they were scattered like this, far apart, they will come together. 
That was the very first thing happened within the cell clustering takes place. Then you have to have a second signal with the CD28 and it's going to talk to B7 and that will initiate a sequence of events which is initiation of kinase activity in terms of activation of transcription factors. What I notice in the older edition and the newer edition, uh, ed edition as well is that uh, the older edition of the book tends to put all these transcription factor as a common factor for all three pathways. It doesn't dif distinguish between any specific pathway. But since more research has been done in that, so we know that it has become very specific. For example, in the old book it says that, you know, calcineurin can influence all these three, which is not the current concept. Or protein kinase C can influence all the transcription factor. No. The latest concept is that they are well-defined transcription factors which go into three important signaling pathways. Okay? Now, once the second signal goes over here, then you got the LCK fin, two important proteins within the cytoplasm, and you get phosphorylation of this ITAM and these attach to these ITAMs. So they kind of, they're scattered over there. They'll just kind of snap onto the ITAMs. The moment they snap onto the ITAMs, we call assembly. And uh, then it will re lead to some of the changes that happen on the membrane. Now this part over here is P PIP2 or diacylglycerol has been known for a long time. I've, I've seen that that hasn't changed much. But I know for sure these enzymes over here, which are proteins, there are tons of research coming up, and that's what the drug targets are. Okay. So LCK, FIN, and ZAP70. So these are the important right now that we believe that our drugs are targeting in terms of uh, initiating or blocking signaling pathway for a T-cell response. But you can see that they process through multiple molecules and then the end result is that, for example, you can go through a calcium pathway, calcineurin, and do the transcription. We have some uh, anti-cancer drug to block calcineurin, for example, over here. Then we have protein kinase C that goes NF kappa B we have some blockers of the anti-cancer drugs that are going to act on this pathway. Then we have uh, RAS and uh, MAP kinases, which is mitogen activated uh, kinases. They're going to go for AP1. So we know for sure, depending upon which disease are we talking about, which drug are we talking about, very specific drugs that are acting on each and every pathway. I, I remember last time um, in, in my last slide, you can, uh, last lecture, you will see uh, last year lecture, I did put up some of the drugs over here, but I noticed this year that, you know, it become more specific. For those drugs were like open to block everybody over here. But now we have very specific drugs that target ZAP70, that target LAT, that target SLP. So all these are there. And if you remember, one of the important thing over here is act, actin reorganization. Does it sound a bell? Like what is actin? Hmm? Fiber. Yeah, act, actin is a muscle protein. Remember, muscle protein. So what happens is that these are muscle protein and they tend to get together. And one of the things that it does is that it, it kind of polymerizes. So it forms some of those tubules there. And many of the tubules act as gates for the interchange of different ions. So you want to create that actin polymerization. You want to make sure that you open up this pore there. And I'm going to come back to it and tell you what's the importance of that pore. Okay? So 
I repeat, first signal, second signal, and these are the proteins which are there within the cytoplasm. They phosphorylate onto I tabs, and the signal gets to the membrane, and then membrane, PIP2 is converted to DAG, and we have initiation of three important pathways leading to three important transcription factors leading to specific genes which are required uh, for gene transcription of proteins. For example, if you want to make a growth factor, IL-2. IL-2 is a growth factor for T cell. So IL-2 will be transcribed, transcribed over here and then it will, this cell will start secreting IL-2. So that's how the signaling pathway works. <clears throat> okay. Now, what I said in the previous um, figure was that this signaling pathway would be similar for CD4, CD8, and even B cell. And uh, also remember when I, we talked about uh, the actin polymerization, that because it reorganizes the internal cytoskeleton. Okay, remember I said that uh, there are three molecules and they are like far apart. Right? So what you need to do is that you need to bring them closer. I call it cluster. How would you do that? You want cell to contract. So what is the contractile protein in the cell? Actin. Does that make sense? So actin has to come and put them together before they go and initiate the signal. And this signaling pathway may occur, as I said, second, minutes, an hour. Some of the... Uh, Reactions may need even eight hours. So it takes a while for us to really signal the proliferation of T cell. Okay, now the same signaling pathway can change a cell from resting to activated cell. Right? The same signaling pathway will change a resting into activated cell. For example, the activated cell will express more MSC class 2. So where is the signal coming from to make more MSC class 2? Same pathway. So unless and until they pass through all these steps, there will not be any MSC class 2. So signaling has to go before uh, it appears. And as a drug discovery, I said that what we need to do is that uh, we sometimes need to block that and prevent activation of T cell. We sometimes need to do for cancer cell, for example. You want to do for some of other cell, okay? And um, when we'll go in detail, when I talk about transplantation or talk about autoimmunity or allergy drugs, I'm pretty much going to talk about all this signaling pathway where exactly a particular drug is working and what is the mechanism of action when one is blocked, how would the rest of the activation go through? Okay, so these are some of the important uh, steps that are there. Now, <clears throat> what I told you so far is that T cell can get activated by an antigen, correct? So whatever you saw in the previous figure was antigen driven. So if you go back, if there was no antigen presented to a T cell, by antigen presenting cell, nothing will happen. So we call that antigen driven process. Or I can be more specific according to your book, it will be called thymus dependent process. Why do I say thymus dependent process? Because it involves T cells. Okay. Now, keep in mind, uh, it's just like electronic circuit. You can break the circuit. You can short circuit it. Okay, so you know the mechanism. You know where the outlets are there and what the switches are. Okay. In theory, there are other ways to activate CD4 T cells. So what I'm trying to say is that we know the system so we can play around with the system. That's what we normally do in the drugs. The one in the previous picture showed you actually what happens in the body. Now, something we call super antigens. 
some some of the antigens are super antigen they are going to cause activation of T cells but guess what they are called super antigen and once they activate the T cell things will be out of control right for example some of the bacterial toxin Staphylococcus aureus so it is going to use your weaponry this is designed to kill microbe to kill you because super antigen and they will cause shock the other thing that we normally do is in lab, sometimes we use plant proteins. So we have these plant proteins. These are called polyclonal activators, Con A, PHA. They are there. And we take your T cells, put these plant activators, can activate that. Well, also keep in mind if you were to give you these plant activators, other than the antigen, we can play around with your T cell because the system is designed. In such a way okay third part is that if you have developed antibodies to those sites which will come and hook on to those receptor site you technically can also initiate the response just like a short circuit okay and then this goes on and on I don't want to go in detail but the point is keep in mind that there are other ways to activate heals okay now <clears throat> uh, as I said earlier one of the things that you want in terms of T cell was to proliferate. So this is one thing normal. You want your T cells to proliferate. You want them to activate. So what will happen is, again, same story. You have first signal and the second signal, intrasignaling pathways happen. This time the signal says, hey, we need to proliferate T cell. But proliferation would not take place until and unless there's a growth factor. The growth factor for T-cell proliferation is IL-2, interleukin-2, okay? Now this uh, interleukin-2, which is a cytokine, has a receptor we call IL-2 receptor. Again, all receptors are proteins. So they, are, they have a gamma chain and a beta chain, right? And what normally it does not have is basically an alpha chain. So alpha chain is not there. So it is there but redundant. It is there but redundant. So once the cell gets activated, it produces IL-2. You can see IL-2 is a cytokine will produce. And this will then again act on the T cells to make that IL-2 receptor functional. So what was happening before was, even if IL-2 was there, there was no receptor to take it. It's like an autocrine pathway. The cell produces a hormone or produces a growth factor and it acts on itself. We call it autocrine. Okay. And then you can see over here that once we got IL-2 in the system, cells will proliferate. And the cells will move to the tissues if there is a homing molecule as well. So this is the first step in terms of signaling pathway where the T cell synthesizes and secretes IL-2, right? And I told you the most important thing for IL-2 is IL-2 receptor alpha chain. It, it, just like a body's mechanism, you must have noticed in endocrinology, it has a pro-hormone. So pro-hormone misses something that is required for actual hormone, so it needs kind of activation. Right, so receptor is their incomplete receptor. What it needs is it needs a alpha chain, and alpha chain will come after signaling pathway, and we get this T cell proliferate and uh, expand. This is a normal function of T cell, and we want T cells to 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 proliferate. Okay. Now the second interaction we talked about the co-stimulatory pathway. And remember, as, as I said, that antigen-presenting cell uh, has a B7, which actually are two molecules, B1 and 7. And one of the steps for active T cell is that CD4 T cell will uh, lock onto that and get activated, right? But we want to put a control on that. There should be a negative signal. So what we do is that we... Instead of expressing CD28, we start expressing CTLA4. So there's a com competitive inhibition 
over here instead of B7 talking to C28 is going to talk to CTLA4 it will inhibit activation so this step is required and that is the one that we normally use for cancer cells because cancer cells go out of control okay so what I would do I mean I'm just giving theory for that I would want uh, cells to show CTLA4 and remember that in drugs we put these receptors onto the cells we have our drugs that will kind of put those receptors or take away receptors from there so that's the important thing CD28 activation and CTLA4 inhibition that's what actually tells you <clears throat> now uh, one of the steps that will happen uh, as I said proliferation of T cell the second thing I told you production of cytokines okay let's see you now what is required for production of cytokines because cytokines are also important they are growth factors if there are no cytokines T cell would not function okay and also keep in mind that uh, when we talked about uh, B cell asking help they always seek help from CD4 T cell the reason being the CD4 T cell produce cytokines so cytokines are important in terms of immune response so let's see what happens in there <clears throat> now we have a, a pathogen or antigen and remember there are different type of cells we have cells of innate immune system dendritic cell we have basophil we have eosinophils so these cells when they see a antigen they produce cytokines they produce different type of cytokines okay now these cytokines then act on to T cells so these cytokines act on the T cells and they divide the T cell into different subsets okay according to the function now you can see from here the activation of specific transcription factors by the cytokines would release at least four different types of cells so previous classification CD4 CD8 the classification of T cell based upon cytokine release which is now the the uh, the accepted or relevant uh, classification is TH1 type TH2 type TH17 type and then we have T Rex regulatory T cells so these are the four important types of T cells that we have each one of them will have different role when we talk of allergies because there are four types of allergies hypersensitivity one two three four so we have different types different drugs in each and every types of allergy but you can see from here then they produce what they need to produce and then they will act on those cells which they need to act upon <clears throat> now let's take an example for this is an example for the th1 so remember th1 one of the T cell subtype TH1 T helper 1 that's what it's called it's a CD4 T cell call it T helper 1 now what happens is that if you have intracellular pathogens like viruses bacteria right and even some self antigens and this is important for you to know because pathogens can be extracellular or can be intracellular some of the pathogens will stay outside and cause the damage some pathogens will be in the cell and cause damage in this case they secrete a cytokine which is IL-12 they secrete a cytokine which is IL-12 and this IL-12 then acts on to T cells so there are T cells over here that they act upon and then convert these CD4 T cells into TH1 type. So infection causes release of IL-12. IL-12 acts on CD4 T cells. CD4 T cells will differentiate into TH1. So that's like a development that we have. 
Now, what will happen is that these Th1 cell, so these are the functions of Th1 cell that you need to know. If I ask you what are the function of Th1 cells, you need to know that number one is that they produce two signature cytokines. We call signature cytokines, and these are gamma interferon and IL-2. And what do they do? These two cytokines activate macrophages to kill bacteria. They activate natural killer activity to enhance antibody-dependent cell-mediated cytotoxicity. These two cytokines cause activation of CD8 T-cell kill virus. They are important in allergy. These are the same cytokines they want to switch B-cell to activate complement. And these are the cytokines they cause conditions like uh, multiple sclerosis and rheumatoid arthritis. So you can see one, two, three, four, five, at least six different functions of these Th1 type cells. So if I was to give you gamma interferon as a drug, which is a cytokine, this is what it would do in terms of the activity of Th1 type cells. Okay, now compare that, maybe you can make a, a table, compare that with uh, TS2. So this is a TS2. TS2, you, you need these cells in parasitic worm infections and allergies. So when you got allergies, you are not producing, remember in pathophysiology I said TH1 is pro-inflammatory. We talked about pro-inflammatory cytokines. When I said TS2, it was anti-inflammatory. Now it's based upon T cell classification. So you will see when you get parasitic infections or you get allergies, you secrete IL-4. In the previous one, what was the cytokine you secreted? IL-12. And IL-12 produce gamma interferon and IL-2. In this case, you have IL-4. It acts on a T cell and passes through the signaling pathway. This is a signaling molecule. Your book talks about that. We'll talk about that when we go in detail in allergies. What does it imply and what are drugs acting on it? It causes TS2 and TS2 then produces IL-4, IL-13 and IL-5. So these are the three molecules that we need to kill worms to have allergic response, especially in allergic asthma. So these are important molecules when we will talk about drugs acting to kill worms, allergic responses, especially allergic asthma, because these cause important switching in terms of antibody production and other things. So Th1 type, Th2 type. The third type was Th17. So these are all sub-branches of CD4. So Th17, you have fungi, and this time you have extracellular bacteria, not the intracellular, and some of the self-antigen. You secrete TGF beta, IL-21, 6, and IL-23. So they act on CD4 T cell. This is a signaling molecule that you can see from here, ROR, and then it changes CD4 into TH17. You produce two hormones, and these uh, two cytokines, these cytokines will kill fungi and extracellular bacteria and also be responsible for some of the autoimmune diseases that we normally see, multiple sclerosis, uh, rheumatoid arthritis, and psoriasis. So these are, when we talk of drugs for these particular conditions, we are going to talk about these particular cytokines. They are released by TH17. And lastly, Tvex, remember regulatory T cells. Now, <clears throat> Foreign and self-antigens, so that's where again R2 immunity. Any foreign antigen or your self-antigen can act on your CD4 T cell by signaling molecule with Fox P3 and will change CD4 to induce, I stand for induced, <laughs> induced T regulatory cell. And it produces a cytokine with TGF beta and these are some of the responses that we have, and you can see it is called T regulatory cell because it's want to regulate the immune responses. So if you are 
hypersensitive, we want to bring you down. If you're hyper energetic, we're going to bring you down. So we're going to give you some of the uh, uh, TGF beta, which is important in terms of suppressor responses. Okay. And I think you can look in your book, and I picked up picture as well, a TH1, the cytokine, and what are the inhibitory roles of the cytokine. And this is the last slide. Just give me one more minute, and I'll be done with that. Now, uh, special interest to flu, because I think we all are going to deal with flu, and vir viruses are always a challenge. And this is something that you may be a little bit more informative than the rest of the journal. People is that uh, flu protein will be picked up by a specific B cell, and then again, it's going to be broken down into small peptides. We call it flu peptides. It will be presented in context with CD uh, MSC class 2, and then it will cause one of the most important things that we normally do is expression of a transcription factor leading to chemokine receptor CXCR5. You see the snake white thing? So that is important for us to generate flu protein specific CD4 T cells. What we're trying to do in the flu chart is we're going to take the small portion of the virus, flu virus that caused infection last year, take it out, present it to your uh, B cells, and B cell is going to internalize, especially in acid vesicles, these are acid vesicles, and present it into class 2, and then traffic it to the surface, and we want specific CD4 T cells to produce. And this will help us to find virus. So, for example, if you want to know what's the current strategy for uh, treating swine flu or bird flu, right? So that's where the drugs are coming from. That's where the drugs are being targeted, right? So it's more of a T cell driven drug as compared to a B cell driven antibody because antibodies alone may not be enough. Okay? So uh, I'll stop.